So we're joined from Westminster by Andrew Cave, who's the Head of Policy and Public Affairs at the Federation of Small Businesses. And right here in the studio with me is Andrew Hilton, a former World Bank economist who now heads the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation. Welcome to you, gentlemen. Good, Good to have you on the show. Andrew Hilton, I'll start with you. An internal barrier between the retail side of the business and then the riskier investment banking operations. Is this the sort of structural change we need to see to prevent another crisis? Well, I don't know, because we don't know what the next crisis is going to be. But we're certainly not f fighting the last war, in that this would not have solved the last crisis. It may well, however, solve the next crisis, if the government has got its analysis right, and if the Commission responding to that has got the recommendations right. Andrew Cave, what's your response to that? Is it largely an unknown now? We're not going to actually... Uh, you know, that we've already had the last crisis. We don't know what new challenges another crisis could throw up. Impossible to say whether this will be effective in preventing another crisis from taking place until they're actually implemented, for one thing. I don't think the reforms that have been uh, proposed today would, stop, would have stopped the previous crisis or necessarily stop another crisis. What they do plan to do is to mitigate any future crisis and ensure that it doesn't have such a damaging impact on the wider economy. Um, what we're talking about today is seeing an implicit guarantee re being retained for uh, the retail arm of banks um, and a refocusing, really, of activities within those parts of the banks on lending to UK PLC. OK, so what are your thoughts on that then, uh, Andrew Hilton, in the studio? What do we know at this point about then how this ring fencing is going to work in practice? Well, we know a lot about how the ring fencing of the retail operation is going to, is going to work. There are certain, certain activities which are mandatory, and they shall be within the retail ring fenced operation. There are certain activities which are prohibited, and they will definitely not be. And then there's a kind of blurry area mm. where banks may or may not choose to operate certain activities out of the retail bank. For the retail ring fence operation, there's going to be separate capital requirements, a separate very tough capital requirements, and the hope is, therefore, that the retail ring fence operation mm. will, in some sense, be protected, and whatever else happens to the world at large, that will not go under. So then, Andrew Cave, yeah, what's your response to that, that, that blurry area that, that uh, Andrew Hilton describes? How much flexibility will it give these institutions? I think we have to wait and see what that blurry area actually looks like. I think the crucial um, uh, thing that's come out from today is finding that the ICB want all business transactions um, and uh, business banking to fall within the retail part of that, which is important. Um, the, the extent to which uh, UK banks have actually financed UK business is, is quite shocking compared to other European countries. Something like 5% of total lending has gone to uh, um, UK corporates. Um, and when you've seen in the, you know, just the last year, £79 billion being transferred from NatWest's retail division across to the uh, investment banking in RBS, um, you see the need to have that that firewall there to ensure that sufficient funds are available. Um, but also, we see over a period of time a change in behavior in the way that, that part, those parts of the banks actually operate and start to take a, a longer term view uh, in how they view uh, relationships with businesses, uh, small, medium, and large. So, uh, Andrew Hilton, what do you think about that? How is this going to affect the bank's relationship with small and medium-sized businesses? Well, with small and medium-sized businesses, it's very clear they are within the retail ring fence. It's mm. the larger companies which are in the furry area, the fuzzy area. Will they go into yeah. the retail bank or will they be outside? But I, I do think it will make the retail operation, in some sense, a profit centre in a way that it hasn't been until now. So it may be that it will actually encourage precisely the kind of small business lending that, that my colleague would like to see and which the, the UK banks have been derelict in not producing. Uh, Andrew Cavia, you're nodding your head. Do you, do you yeah, agree I, with that? I do agree with that because um, the fact that the retail side of these banks will have that implicit uh, government guarantee will actually make it much more attractive for banks to transfer money across to those divisions. Um, and hopefully th that will be possible um, through this ring fence. Uh, whilst in the past we've seen a steady flow of, of money in the other direction. 
Okay, so uh, then let me get, uh, I mean, what about the idea that it's going to be, Andrew Hilton, what about the idea that this is going to be incredibly complex in its implementation? I mean, you know, you're expressing the view that, that contrary to what we keep hearing, this is actually going to boost lending in some ways to smaller businesses. I mean, there are those that say that this is going to increase the cost of financing for the banks and actually they're going to hold on to that money. Well, that's possible. The two are not incompatible. There may be more lending for SMEs, but it may, may cost more. That's mm -hmm. a possibility. I think the general, the, the general cost of implementing this yeah. over a very long period is derisory if we actually get the structure right. Uh, the cost of the, the crisis post Lehman Brothers to the UK banking sector was, it is estimated, about £850 billion in total. This is trivial. So if we get it right now, if we get the structure of banking right now, we can say that we've got pretty good value for the, the independent commission. Andrew Cave, long-term implications for potentially for the landscape of the big British banks, Do, are we getting the structure right? I think uh, certainly we're moving in the right direction to have a much more stable structure. Um, and whilst the debate in recent weeks has fo focused almost exclusively on ring fencing, the other critical aspect of today's report deals with competition. Mm. And to see uh, um, additional branches sold off by Lloyds, but crucially also um, Lloyds being tasked and the government being tasked with setting up a, a competitor bank, I think will be very important. And that will, for the vast majority of small businesses, will change the landscape quite significantly in the, the long to medium term. Andrew Hilton, the other side of the argument, I suppose, is that we could be moving very slowly, but nevertheless surely, towards an uncompetitive city of London. Yes, yes, that certainly is what the investment banks will say. Now, whether that's true or not, I, I don't know. I mean, this, this battle, th this is an opening shot. The battle is going to be fought out over the next couple of years. We have a long implementation period. The detailed proposals are, you know, the, de the complexity of the proposals is very considerable. There's a lot to fight for yet. And of course, what we've concentrated on so far is what's inside the ring fence. What really the battle is going to be fought over is what's outside the ring fence. What, are the cap what will be the capital backing for investment banks? Will investment banks implicitly ever be protected by government guarantee? After all, the assumption here is that no matter what happens outside the ring fence, the government will not stand behind it. But if that's a very, very large sized operation, if it's uh, Barclays, Barcaps operation, can the government afford not to stand behind it? Uh, well, so let me ask you, Andrew Cave, when we speak about long-term implications, are we going to see then the cost of capital for the investment bank go up, given that the perception is that they would be allowed to fail if it came to that? I think it's probably inevitable that the cost of capital will go up if that guarantee is removed. But I don't see uh, there's, there's certainly not an appetite amongst UK taxpayers or the government uh, to carry on guaranteeing those risky uh, activities. Um, and quite frankly, they're, they're sim we don't have the resources to be able to do that. So that probably will lead to an increase in the cost of capital, and it will possibly lead to um, uh, banks being less uh, uh, um, com uh, competitive. Mm. Um, but the crucial thing is that the banks need to be there to support uh, wider growth in the economy. Um, and that hasn't been the case um, for too long now. Uh, we need to see uh, banks actually behaving in the way they did uh, 40 years ago, where they were much more readily uh, available with finance for businesses that wanted to grow. That's where growth comes from, and that's where the growth that is felt by most people in this country and the growth that creates jobs uh, uh, resides. I suppose, Andrew Hilton, again, the other side of the coin is that these recommendations lessen the chance of the banks actually playing that role when it comes to driving growth. I'm thinking about, again, the point that you mentioned about restrictions on this sort of cross-funding between retail and investment arms of banks. Uh, and, and it doesn't help you know, the situation or it doesn't inspire one with much confidence when you have the likes of Ernst & Young, their item club forecast, saying that actually uh, these recommendations could increase the cost of borrowing for big companies by one and a half percent over several quarters. Well, I'm, I'm sceptical about any of these sorts of 
estimates. I think that that kind of projection depends on the assumptions and you know page 20 of the assumptions you'll find at least find a little nugget that you can agree with or disagree with. No it, it, it's impossible to say what the impact is on that but on the investment banking side the argument is being made that if there isn't the possibility of cross subsidy if there isn't the possibility of using government guaranteed deposits to fund casino banking then that will put UK institutions at a competitive disadvantage with regard to institutions locally Located elsewhere. I think that's a dodgy argument mm. in that, um, you know, yes, maybe in the short run, but in the longer term, nobody really wants to see, no, no other jurisdiction wants to see their banks using subsidised deposits to fund casino banking. So I think we are in the forefront of this. Others will follow. Andrew Cave, what do you make of that? Are we likely to see others follow in Britain's ring-fencing footsteps, if you like? I think you'll see that. You'll also see others following in uh, increasing capital requirements. We're already seeing it in places like Switzerland. Um, so uh, both internationally and in the UK, there is a growing consensus that a form of ring fencing is required, but also capital requirements should be much higher. Uh, what we're concerned about now is ensuring that the timetable for the implementation um, of these reforms uh, is adhered to and that they happen sooner rather than later. The complexity of it shouldn't uh, stop government from moving as fast as it possibly can to get implementation so that we start to see the benefits of these reforms sooner rather than later. It's a tough one, isn't it, Andrew Hilton, because we speak about uh, we speak about a timetable for the implementation of these recommendations, but this is a tough spot that David Cameron now finds himself in, because on the one hand, there is this public outcry, you've got to be tougher on the banks. On the other hand, he must be very worried about hurting the banks to the point where that hurts growth. Well, he's also worried about the impact that uh, uh, the opposition of the banks will have on the... Tory party's political chances at the next election. It's, it is a tough one, but remember that implementation is not just a fact, not just a function of, of the UK pushing through legislation. There's also the Basel III uh, regulatory rules coming in, and they really now are implemented through until 2019, and that's what's setting the 2019 date. They have to, the, the, rule, the new rules that we have coming out have to be implemented in parallel with Basel. We can't go ahead on this, so really we are determined by what's happening elsewhere in the regulatory framework. Tenl, I want to pick up on a point that you made just before we went to break about adhering to Basel III requirements in tandem with these new rules as well here in the UK. How difficult is it going to be to, uh, to implement these reforms? How difficult is it going to be for the banks to get to work on this so that, if you like, they're in harmony with each other? Well, I think the banks are already moving towards implementation of Basel III. They know the timetable. Basel has to do with capital. Uh, they know that they have to increase their capital base. This really adds another layer of capital on top of of what Basel was going to, to require anyway. But Basel sets out the implementation schedule. All of these, these, this capital raising has to be in place by the time that Basel III is fully operational, which will be 2019. Andrew Cave, I'm just wondering, how big is the risk of confusion when it comes to regulation? How dangerous is that for the banks? Should the government have just focused on getting them to adhere to the Basel III agreement? Well, I'm not a banking expert. Um, however, we are told, and I believe, that we have some of the sharpest minds operating in the finance uh, industry in the UK. And I don't think it's beyond them to be able to deal with Basel III, which has been on the blocks for a long time, is well understood and is in the process of being implemented, at the same time as taking on um, the recommendations today. Um, so I think it should be the two complement each other and it should be perfectly possible to achieve all of this by 2019 you know, at the latest. How difficult is it going to be, Andrew Hilton, to understand this labyrinth of new regulation, if you like, that are, that's going to be implemented by different countries around the world? You were just saying that other countries could follow in, in the footsteps of UK banks. This could potentially create a great deal of confusion, couldn't it? I think it probably will. And, and one should be very careful to, to, to remember that the Americans, for instance, haven't even implemented Basel II yet, let alone Basel III. So the Americans are lagging behind. They also have their own equivalent of what we're doing, uh, the, the so-called Volcker rule, and the regulations for that are to be published this week. But that was supposed to be implemented in 2012. It certainly is running at least three or four years behind. So there are many, many 
initiatives all running either in parallel or at cross purposes. Bankers at the moment are spending most of their time ticking boxes as far as regulation is concerned and not actually doing the things that uh, our friends at the Small Business Federation would like them to do. Yeah, what's your response to that, Andrew Cave? These cross-parallel initiatives going on in different countries, if you like, it's going to make uh, timetables somewhat unrealistic to some extent, isn't it? Um, well, I don't think that the timetable of 2019 uh, is unrealistic, but as I said before, I'm not an expert. Yeah. I think what it is absolutely uh, imperative is that we do not give uh, any scope for bankers to drag their feet uh, needlessly on this. And this is where we very much turn to the politicians and to government to ensure that uh, the recommendations today, which they have uh, uh, agreed need to happen, uh, happen within that timetable. We would like to see um, elements of this folded into the finance bill this autumn. If that's not possible, then we would certainly like to see uh, that um, uh, in the budget next next year. Now that's uh, not implementation obviously, uh, but enacting uh, what needs to happen. Implementation will of course take longer, um, but 2019 is a way off yet, so I would think that gives enough scope uh, to be able to reach that target. Andrew Hilton, I want to raise one point with you, and again it's an argument that we have heard repeatedly uh, about the timing of these reforms happening when you've got the OECD, the ECB, the Fed, all revising down their growth forecasts. Prospects for the second half of the year here in the UK are not great. In fact, they're pretty grim. Is this the right time to be bringing this sort of regulatory upheaval to the banks? Well, there's never a good time for it. And I think that the banks will always complain whenever it's done. Um, but you could argue that this is a bad time. On the other hand, you could argue that it's a very easy time to be a banker at the moment. Because after all, the government is essentially lending you money at virtually zero interest rates at sort of half a percent and then borrowing it back from you for, for sovereign, uh, sovereign debt at two and a half, three and a half percent. You know, that's not brain surgery. You can actually finish by three o'clock and go play golf. So this is not a bad time in that sense. And it's certainly a time in which we should worry about some of the issues that are being raised by the small businesses. There isn't enough credit getting into the small business market. We all agree about that. We all agree that something has to be done. And maybe, maybe that this is a step in the right direction. I mean, Andrew Cave, yeah, you're a quick final response from you. Not enough credit getting small businesses and this could tighten the situation even more. Uh, that's completely the case. I mean, something like 30% of small businesses have missed their growth opportunity this year because they haven't been able to access finance. However, that's not an argument for uh, stalling this reform. Short-term circumstances are not an excuse for uh, introducing reforms for the medium and long-term safety uh, of the economy. Um, and there is a precedent here. The Glass-Steagall's Act, which was in introduced in the United States, um, was introduced during difficult times. Um, and it was accompanied with an easing, a temporary easing of capital requirements. And if that were thought necessary here, then that's possibly worth considering. Um, but the timetable must be stuck to. OK, well, thanks very much indeed. A UK glass seagull, that's a debate we'll have to have another time. But thanks very much indeed. Andrew Cave, Head of Policy for the Federation of Small Businesses. And here in the studio with me, Andrew Hilton of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation. Thank you, gentlemen, for your time.